All right, hello everybody. Uh, looks like maybe we could have a video. I kind of got uh, a little work done on my on my pad here. Uh, I'm sorry you guys had to sort of be the guinea pig for my videos this uh, this class. Uh, but uh, hey, I, I really do enjoy putting these together for you because they're in, they're still essential. And uh, you still have a little time here to watch uh, what I have to say. Uh, today we're looking at the Global Society chapter. And so since I can't run a real long uh, video, uh, I'm going to just touch base with two of these theorists. The ones that uh, I uh, know pretty well. I mean, I know all of them, but uh, uh, for example, I'm going to talk about Emmanuel Wallerstein and the... Uh, World Systems Theory, because I did my master's thesis in sociology on World Systems Theory. I spent two years writing my thesis and researching my thesis on Wallerstein's uh, theoretical model. And also George Ritzer. I've used his work before. So I just want to touch base with those to give you a couple examples of, of um, especially for Wallerstein, of how, how his theory can be utilized to do an analysis and uh, um, so uh, I spent two years uh, working on my master's uh, thesis as I said and uh, so in some ways I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with uh, with Wallerstein himself and his theory I spent more time I tell my wife and my kids I spent more time in those two years with Wallerstein than I did with my own family Uh, anyway, so anyway, here's my, here's what my thesis looks like, my master's thesis. It's getting old now. This was in 1990, and uh, I finished my master's during my first semester in graduate school at York University. Uh, so I had to go back to Central Michigan University to uh, do my oral defense um, on on my, my thesis, and it's 150, 156 page uh, theoretical writing thesis and the title of it is a sociology of the world systems paradigm theoretical overview and a critique so I, I look basically lay out all of the uh, predecessors of the theory early influences uh, and look at the main concept conceptions of the theory uh, and then I lay out some of the major criticisms of this uh, theory and then I, f I finished this up with doing a case study utilizing uh, Wallerstein's theory to ameliorate it a little bit. Uh, uh, Wallerstein focuses on the, the states that make up the world system, the various countries, states. And, uh, but I will utilize it to look at uh, regions within uh, a country. So you can also use his three-tier model of the core and periphery within a country. And or looking at how a region of the country uh, contributed to the uh, stability of the world system, and in this instance, I'm looking at my home area of the of the American South, and uh, so I talk about how the South has acted acted historically as a peripheral region within a core country uh, to to uh, produce raw materials, uh, basically for the uh, uh, for the advent of the Industrial Revolution in England. So uh, in terms of its function, the South played a functional role, and slavery did as well, in the, uh, in the emergence of uh, uh, capitalism. And I'll say a few more things about that uh, as we go. Uh, so you're looking at uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein. Uh, his main, one of his main thesis is that the world economy, the capitalist world economy, did uh, didn't uh, globalize uh, like some theorists. I think uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, Scalaire talks about emerging this global system in the mid 20th century, second half of the 20th century. Manuel Wallerstein says no, it emerged way back in the 1500s in the 16th century uh, due to uh, developments in shipping and colonization and trade, world travel. That's when this uh, the, the capitalist world system began, and uh, Wallerstein wrote four 
for a historical, he's a historical sociologist as well as a theorist, um, but he wrote four editions. Well, he, he wrote three of them, and the fourth one I don't think he's completed as yet. But he's already written three of a four-volume set uh, in attempting in a very ambitious way uh, the, uh, the the entire history of the modern world, so to speak, rewriting it in terms of his theory. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm looking over here because I've got your I've got your PowerPoint up. Uh, they define globalization. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of that. Uh, they do look at Emmanuel Wallerstein's biographical sketch. I'll let you guys look at that. A world system, he defines the world system as a social system. One that has boundaries, structures, member groups, rules of legitimation, and coherence and order. Uh, its life is made up of conflicting forces which hold it together by tensions and tear it apart as each group seeks eternally to, re, uh, to, re, to remold it to its own advantage. It has the characteristics of an organism. We'll come back to that. And that it has a lifespan over which its characteristics change in some respects and remain stable uh, in others. According to Wallerstein, to this point in history, there have been only two types of world systems in existence. Before the world capitalist economy emerged, we had world empires like uh, Egypt, for example, and, uh, in, in, during the Middle Ages. Um, we even talk about the, the uh, British Empire, but the British Empire was, uh, had become basically capitalist. But anyway, and then the other one is world economies. Um, but uh, let's just step back here. When I was uh, critiquing the world systems theory, on the one hand, its major influence was uh, was Karl Marx, Marx's Marx's uh, theory and conflict theory. Uh, he bounced off of Marx. Uh, Marx gave a, uh, he only theorized about the internal workings of a nation, particular nation state, in most part England. And he talks about the proletariat and the bourgeoisie within countries. World, uh, uh, Wallerstein turns this outward. He, he flips it inside out. And now he says, hey, now the class structure is on a world stage. We're not talking about any one nation isolation. We're talking about the whole world system of nations. Within that world system of nations, you have core countries, which kind of acts like Marx's uh, bourgeoisie. The, that's the ruling class. Those core rich industrialized countries. And then you have on the other end of the spectrum, you have the peripheral nations, and they're sort of the same as the proletariat. These are the working poor, you know, that, that give their raw materials to the cat, to the core country. And the uh, the uh, peripheral countries end up historically uh, becoming underdeveloped as they are colonized and, and uh, exploited for their raw materials, such that even today when we look at these co particular countries, there's, they tend to still be in poverty, and his theoretical statement is that they're in poverty because of, on the backs of these countries, that the wealthy countries developed, you know, in science and industry and development uh, at the expense of, so we call it the, the development of underdevelopment. The peripheral countries were systematically being underdeveloped and exploited for the raw materials, at the same time that these core countries were emerging because they were taking all the wealth out of those countries, like, you know, going to uh, South America and taking the Incas gold and silvers back to Spain, right? To feed their own, to, to you know, to line their own pockets, so to speak, with the exploits from these countries. Um, so there's a political basis there in the theory. Um, so, you know, the other notion was that uh, the poor countries are poor because they lack our Western ideals and values and uh, work ethic and blah, 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 and rationality. And, uh, Washington said, no, it's on, it's, on, it's on us. that It's because of their exploitation that we have all the goodies, right, and the science and, and all the things that the rest of the world supposedly envies, you know. Um, so 
Uh, but, however, it, uh, in my thesis, I also state that Wallerstein was also influenced by structural functionalism. Because on one hand, he's interested in it as, as a system that, that can be studied objectively. It's, a, it's an existing system beyond we individuals. Uh, and in this case, case beyond individual uh, nation states. Uh, and also, he, he says it's kind of like an organism. That's, that's straight out of functionalism, looking at society or the world system as an organism and the playing parts of the nation states that make it up. And it's, it's eternally remolding itself to groups for its advantages, for their national advantages, but in the end, it's, uh, it tries to help remain stable. So over the lifespan, uh, which its characteristics change in some respects, but it remains stable in others, you know, it's just, it changes as, as it's remolded, but it re tends to remain stable over, over time. Uh, and that's functionalist uh, theory. Um, let's move on to... Uh, so this, the, remember that the, there's only three, really three major concepts to the theory. That's the, that's the uh, status positions of nation states. So you have the core, semi-periphery, and the periphery. Um, the strong developed states dictate the terms of international economic trade to, the, to their relative advantage. Now, the core countries, let's go over the core of the modern world system includes the United States, talking about con uh, contemporarily, uh, in the contemporary period now, uh, the United States, Japan, and other similarly industrialized nation states, we'd have to include now China and India, uh, controls vast majority of the world's wealth while producing a highly skilled workforce that is controlled through wage payments. On the other end of the spectrum, the periphery is exploited for its raw materials such as cotton, sugar, rubber, gold exported, and gold exported to the core. Often possessions of, or colonies of core states are peripheries. The workforce in the periphery historically has been controlled through coercive means, also slavery. And today it still breeds the worst of labor conditions in those countries. Uh, so uh, the, the, many of the problems in the, the underdeveloped in those, those countries uh, reflects our own advantages that have been uh, geared over the, over the several hundred years. Um, now, country, the, the core, and then you got the uh, one more, and it's, so the core is kind of like Marx's bourgeoisie. The, the periphery is kind of like Marx's proletariat. Then you get this middle level, and it's kind of like the middle class, which Marx didn't really he talk about the petite bourgeois, but uh, didn't theorize much about the role of the middle class, uh, which was important for he can eat capitalist development later on. Uh, the semi-periphery occupies a, a position between the core and periphery. Economically and politically, it's weaker than the former but stronger than the latter. It just falls in between the periphery and the core. Labor force historically controlled through sharecropping arrangements. First emerged in the Mediterranean region of Europe, a position that today includes most of Eastern Europe, Mexico, and parts of South America uh, are um, seen as semi-peripheral. China, India as well, uh, not too long ago, were also seen as peripheral countries as well as some of your Pacific Rim countries, um, uh, Taiwan, for example, and some and other uh, countries there uh, seen as semi-peripheral. Uh, but now with now in the world system, China and India are both vying with the United States uh, to, to be in the core uh, position. Uh, to be in the hegemonic core. So among your core countries, you have one, generally in every historical epoch, you have one country that's the, that's the uh, what we call the hegemonic country. It, it, it's uh, the top dog, if you will. And it uh, dictates the economic uh, rules and regulations for the rest of the world system, the core countries. So up until World War II, Britain was the... Uh, was the hegemonic country, and uh, its its um, its money was pounds was was this, like the gold standard, and then the, after World War II, the United States became the hegemonic core country. Now at this present moment, 
China is vying for that. Uh, China is vying for that hegemonic position. We see that being played out right now. Uh, and uh, with the notion of, of the United States moving away from the international arena, backing off more towards a sort of nationalism, uh, that's, that could be a very much a negative. Certainly may have some positive for some things, but negative, negative in the sense that we will be increasingly losing influence on the world stage because in areas like China, or with China and the Pacific Rim, they may go their own way. You've already heard him say that in Europe after we left the the accord, uh, the Paris Accord on, on on climate change, that they 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 feel they can no longer rely on us. So they they say Let's, we'll just go our own way. So what they could end up doing is uh, other countries taking the lead, their currency becoming the uh, international uh, uh, standard, and uh, that would put us in. It could eventually, if there's no disasters. Uh, it could could put us in and uh, take us out of the hegemonic position. It could be uh, China, for example. But anyway, that's for another cut discussion for another class. All right. Um, so okay. Uh, for the most part, while while it's done theoretical orientation, if you think about it, it's collective for sure. Just like Marxism, Marx and. Uh, uh, Durkheim's work, uh, structural functionalism, conflict theory, it's collective and, and it doesn't look at the everyday level of the individual symbols as symbolic interaction and actionism does in phenomenology and some of the other micro sociologies. Uh, but it's collective rational because of the core periphery, semi-periphery world system. It has all this to do with the rationality of the economic market, the capitalist economic uh, uh, area arena where decisions are being made by various actors, those actors being nation states. And so it's very much a collective, rational, uh, theoretical orientation. All right. Now, um, I'll walk over here to, we don't have but a few more minutes. I want to go over here just for a second. Uh, just to give you a few hints about Ritz's work. Uh, let's read about his biography. But Ritz, Ritz, Ritz's work in the areas of consumption and globalization is influenced by, uh, again, Karl Marx. Western capitalism is an exploitative economic system driven by the pursuit of profit, plus the spread of cultural hegemony. Cultural hegemony, that word hegemony then is to be the top dog in terms of the spread of cultural values and norms and it's what it, cultural tastes. So, you know, nowadays we find in, in uh, very remote areas of, of the world that this cultural hegemony has had its, its in, in impact because you find tribal peoples with their cell phones, uh, you know, they love Western goods, they love go shopping at the mall. You know, we have a profound impact on on styles and fashion, musical tastes, movies especially. Uh, though increasingly, the uh, uh, Bollywood in India is uh, is coming on coming on strong, as well as uh, British uh, film industry as well is uh, has uh, stepped up. Um, but uh, so we know Marx influenced them. But also uh, Western capitalism, but also Weber very much so. Uh, he talks about the iron cage logic of the bureaucracy, uh, critical theory, irrationality, irrationality. So you see where he's, his predecessor, he has borrowed from uh, at least three theoretical schools to talk about his uh, McDonaldization of society. And McDonaldization is actually just talking about the bureaucratic, uh, the ongoing uh, bureaucratization bureauc 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 of uh, postmodern society. So you look at the definition of bureaucracy for Weber and then look at uh, on which one? This is uh, slide 19 and you can see this. The McDonaldization, the McDonaldization of society is defined by efficiency, calculability, predictability, control through non-human technology, Irrationality of rationality. 
very rational. So he, taught, he, he used Mac, the McDonald's food chains as a metaphor to talk a, about what's going on in society overall. And uh, if, if the, I'm sure most of you have been to a McDonald's, and probably a lot of us more than once, and we kind of know how it runs. And it, uh, all of these fit the bill for, for McDonald's. Uh, it's efficient, everything, the food, how it's made, what goes on it, the timing of its production, everything is predictable. It's, it's calculable. It's controlled through non-human technology. The machines are moving things along. And uh, it's based in the ration, irrationality of a very rationalized system. Uh, so there's not a lot of choice. The, the menu is set up to look like it has choices. There's really few choices there. And uh, so, but then he takes the notion of McDonaldization. He applies that to all many other spheres of our uh, existence in uh, in our highly bureaucratic society. So, for example, one we can talk about closer to home would be education. So, doing these online classes is a symptom. is It's a McDonaldization of education uh, to a great extent. Uh, it's it's done efficiently. Well, maybe some of you will maybe not think so efficient, right? Should be predictable, but not always. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's McDonaldized uh, because it tends to be formatted the way it is. And uh, it's kind of hard to really, it's getting better with technology being doing vi being able to do videos or online webinars is my next step. And humanizing this. Uh, but before that, and, and a lot of professors still do this, they don't have any videos or personal touch so much. And it's pretty much just runs as a formatted uh, type of course. And it really, in some sense, doesn't take care of the needs of, it's hard to, to for students who are always warned taking an online classes that you got to be able to work on your own, right? You've got to have that ability to study on your own and do your work. Uh, if you tend to be very dependent on a professor and you need more, we do the best we can, but many times we can't. We don't really get to know our students all that well, so we don't really know uh, what their individual needs are. Even in class, it's kind of difficult, really. Uh, there's a certain average uh, student that the classes are geared to, towards. So somebody who's very gifted in whatever the subject matter is, they may feel bored uh, with the material. They may feel like it's not challenging enough, and then for those who or really have a difficult time with the course material, uh, uh, they're also not uh, maybe getting the best benefit uh, if, they, if they were in class, you know, and a professor could have more uh, interaction with the students. So it's McDonaldized. Uh, another kind of class I used to teach in, in Detroit was a four weekend course. So we would take this class in class at a center somewhere, you would come four weekends. So you come on a Friday, spend your Friday evening in class, get up early in the morning. Class started at 8.30 the next morning, went on to about two in the afternoon on Saturday. And, but we would finish that class in four weekends. Very McDonaldized education, you know. Um, and it, and some, some people, some educators appreciate it. I mean, I... I I know how to put together a short formatted course, but on the other end, it's, a lot of professors uh, and administrators don't like it because they feel like students really are not learning what they should over a long period of time. So for example, even when I was in Canada, I had, I had some of my classes that were a year long. They were not uh, even one semester. We would have a, th my theory class was, of course that was a doctorate, but most doctorate courses in the United States, universities would be, uh, basically just a semester. Uh, but in Canada, our main, our, our methods courses, theory courses, research courses were all a year long. So you started in September and didn't finish until May. And you had, uh, generally you had a lot more books. You had anywhere from four to eight books a class in our seminars, weekly seminar. But anyway, so that's uh, pretty much uh, uh, that. And, uh, uh, you know, oh, I was going to give you an example real quick. So what I did with my thesis with world systems theory was uh, I looked at the American South, and, I, and my thesis basically was that the South was 
acted as a peripheral region within, at that time during the slavery years, it was a semi-peripheral country in the United States. We were colonies before the revolution. Uh, and uh, uh, so the South, you know, the, the earlier the uh, historical writing said that the South helped to industrialize the Northeast of the United States. Didn't really pay attention to the actual global reach of the economic economic activities of the American South, but when you take it take it if you put on the lens of uh, of what the world systems theory, then you're able to see that oh okay, you know actually what was going on at the world level was that uh, as England was beginning to industrialize, going through those earlier industrialize industrial period changing over to an industrialized economy, the first in the world. America, the American South acted as a kind of conveyor belt of, of that raw material of cotton. So that cotton was moved on to the Northeast. In the Northeast, it was like semi-finished there. Then it was shipped to uh, England for finishing. And uh, so it was in England. That's what a lot of those early factories were, were basically cotton mills for the most part, fabric mills. And uh, so the American South played an, a, a functional role in the emergence of uh, world capitalism. And, and, and directly uh, slavery, those who were enslaved, played a, a functional role in the emergence of modern capitalism. And that was using uh, Wallerstein's theory in sort of a, a modified way. Uh, looking at a region. So most countries tend to have regions within their countries that are kind of a hinterland or a peripheral area where there's a lot of raw materials. And we see that in in almost every nation you can think of. There tends to be a, a more industrialized region of the country, but then there'll be these uh, more isolated uh, agricultural, uh, more underdeveloped regions that uh, tend to cater to the metropoles, the urban areas of that uh, country. Uh, and it's, and it's, uh, it's, it's worth looking at. It's also been used to look at uh, issues for people in called the fourth world, and that being the indigenous nations and uh, what they have experienced historically. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and cut this off. We're at 27 minutes, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and load this up. All right, everybody study up for your final exam. All right.